Excellent. Well, uh, welcome here, everybody. I'm so excited to have people here for uh, this installment of the Monarch Safe webinar series. Uh, this is a topic that I'm super, super pumped about. It's one that comes up all the time. Uh, there is massive interest in this topic, and that is, of course, native versus non-native milkweeds. Is there a difference? Does it even matter? Let's find out. Uh, we have a couple of amazing hosts presenting today. We have Katie Lynn Bunny from the, uh, or, sorry, the Education Coordinator with Monarch Joint Venture, Venture and she is joined by uh, Jake Koenig, uh, also from the Monarch Joint Venture as the Midwest Habitat, ha pardon me, Midwest Habitat Coordinator. Um, so like before, there's going to be a roughly 40-ish minutes of presentation, and then we will uh, save time at the end for facilitated Q&A. Uh, I have to imagine there will be lots of great questions because it's an amazing topic that people have lots of opinions about. So uh, let's not waste any more time with me. Let's kick it off uh, to Katie and hear all about it. Take it away, Katie. K Katie Lynn. Thanks, Zach. You good. <laughs> Thanks, Zach. Hi, everybody. Um, as Zach said, my name is Katie Lynn Bunny. I'm the Education Coordinator for the Monarch Joint Venture. Um, if you're not familiar with MJV, we're a national nonprofit working to conserve the monarch butterfly and its migration through habitat education, science, and partnership. So everything that we do is based in partnership, um, and we focus our efforts in those three areas of habitat education and science. My wheelhouse is education as the Education Coordinator, so I'm involved in stuff like this. Um, and I'll let Jake introduce his programs, but a lot of my work is um, through professional development programs, public programs, and then, um, you know, things like this, sharing information with professional groups and things like that. So I'll let Jake introduce himself and then we'll get started. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, my name is Jake Koenig. Like Zach said, I am the Midwest Habitat Coordinator for MJV. And pretty much what that means is I work with farmers, landowners, and anybody that's really interested in putting in uh, pollinator habitat, giving them technical assistance on any of their questions, um, and then helping them find programs that could fit for them to find cost share uh, and things of that nature. Um, so super exciting topic. Uh, I love milkweeds for a reason. Um, and we'll, we'll get in more in depth here today and I'll let uh, Katie Lynn take it away. All right, thanks, Jake. And all right, so today's topic, as Zach mentioned, is uh, native milkweeds versus non-native milkweeds. You know, what's the difference? Why does it matter? And I'm going to preface this presentation by saying that, um, as with any scientific topic, there's often disagreement um, on you know what's native versus non-native, what's good versus bad. Um, but we are sharing the the consensus of what's out there for scientific data on native, non-native, and, and invasive um, plants. So um, we will be sharing resources that you can use to hopefully um, build out your milkweed and, and pollinator gardens, um, but we'll also have resources available. I can share them with Zach on other information that you're looking for more stuff too. So, to get started, um, let's make sure we're all on the same page of native, non-native, and invasive. So native plant is one that's essentially part of, you know, naturally private area because it's developed over many years, many thousands of years often in a particular region or ecosystem. A non-native or exotic plant is something that's originated from somewhere other than the current location. So it's been introduced to the place where it's now growing. And then an invasive plant is um, something that outcompetes other species. So, and often can cause damage to the ecosystem in some way, shape, or form. So you can be non-native and not invasive, or you can be non-native and invasive. Um, so there is some difference there. And plants can be non-native invasive in one area, and then non-native not invasive in another area. It just kind of depends on the conditions it's growing in, the climate, the temperature, all that kind of stuff. So I'll also mention that there are over a hundred species of milkweed that are native to North America. So you can look for what's native to your region in local native plant guides, and we'll share some resources later. Jake has some wonderful um, opportunities for um, all of that. Here are some to start with. The Xerces Society, Pollinator Partnership, and National Wildlife Federation have really great um, plant finding resources. 
resources. And then um, we'll mention these resources again, but you can find local nurseries both in the MJD vendor map and the Circe's Milkweed Seat Finder tool on their website. Um, and we'll talk about this more later, but we've really cautioned everybody to avoid tropical milkweed because it's not, not native and it can perpetuate disease and winter breeding of monarchs. Um, and I'll talk more about that in a little bit. But before we get to that, I wanted to cover a little bit about milkweed identification. So milkweeds are part of the Asclepius genus. Um, and there are, I mentioned in the slide before, over 100 species. There's approximately 130 species of milkweed in North America. They're in the same family as dogbane. So you might be familiar with the, the different species of dogbane throughout the, um, the continent. Um, Milkweed and dogbane are mistaken for each other. Um, so keep an eye out for that. Um, the actual dogbane plant, that the one that's called dogbane, is not a host plant for monarchs. So don't look for monarchs on it, it won't be there. Um, they, milkweed gets its name from um, the milky sap or latex sap that most milkweed species have. Not all of them have it, but most of them do. Um, but all milkweed species have the next, or I should say almost all species have the next few things in common. They all have this really complex flower shape with these hoods that you can see and the horn coming out of it. And it's like, um, so the, oh, no, my mouse froze. So the, the hood that you can see here and then the horn coming out of it and then this star shape is something that all milkweed flowers have in common. They all have that general shape. That shape can take um, different size and slightly different forms. Um, so you can see this showing the feet on the right here. The, the hoods are a little bit more elongated than the one in the photo here, um, but they all have that general shape. <laughs> they also all produce seed pods and all but one species of milkweed is wind dispersed. Aquatic milkweed, which is native to the Southeast, um, it disperses its seed on the surface of the water. So, um, but they still have the same general um, seed pod shape and then the actual seeds themselves look like other milkweed seeds. So milkweed is the only host plant for monarch butterflies, which is why we're concerned about it, uh, but it's also a really great nectar source when it is blooming. And so they all have this, these things in common, um, but there's also a lot of variation amongst it. So there's some milkweeds that have very narrow leaves, some milkweeds that have very broad leaves, um, like showy milkweed or uh, common milkweed. And then there's some that don't have any leaves. <laughs> they just grow like stalks in, in the desert. And then the other thing to note is that milkweeds will bloom and emerge at different times. So there's some milkweeds that come up sooner, some milkweeds that come up later, and um, depending on where you're at, they may not all be at the same time. Jake and I are based in the Midwest. I'm in Minnesota, he's in Nebraska, and, and at least in Minnesota, most of the milkweeds all bloom within the same, you know, six to eight week period. Um, but I know that in other parts of the country, some of them will bloom earlier, some of them will bloom later. Um, and then even here in Minnesota, you know, depending on the garden or the, the habitat area, some types of milkweed will come up first and then the rest will come later. So just keep an eye on that. Um, that's something to consider when you're planting your milkweeds, especially if you're in California or um, a place like Texas where monarchs are coming through and they need to find milkweed right away. The, the focus in California has been early emerging milkweeds. Um, and there's like the, the California milkweed, the Asclepius, I think it's Asclepius California, this is the, the type of milkweed that a lot of conservation efforts have been focused on. So there's a lot of variation in both the height of the plant, the height, the, the, the color and the size of the flower, the types of leaves, uh, but there's also some variation in how they grow. So some types of milkweed grow by rhizomes under the soil, and some have a tap or a fibrous root. So rhizomes, um, milkweeds that grow from rhizomes, they still have a little bit of this, you know, growth system on the ground, but they will, you know, put out these suckers of um, more shoots of milkweed plants that are still technically the same plants. So you can see there's soil between these, um, these two stalks, 
but underground they are the same plant. And obviously that's really difficult to know unless you take them all up. So generally speaking, um, we consider each of these um, ramets is what they're called. We can, we, for monitoring purposes, we would consider them separate plants, even though they're most likely the same plant. Um, and then you have tap or fibrous roots. So those, those roots go much deeper into the soil um, and, you know, seeking water and things like that. And, and, you know, common milkweed, for those of you who have common milkweed, has both. They send out really deep tap root and then they also put out something. So it's a very persistent plant. <laughs> Uh, but there's a lot of variation in how milkweed grows and it's important to know that when you're planning your garden because um, things like common milkweed or showy milkweed that's spread by, by rhizomes um, can sometimes escape the garden bed. So it's just something to watch for. Um, there's a lot of diversity by location. Uh, so look for local resources. Uh, Modern Drain Venture has some resources, but Cersei's really has an awesome milkweed exploitation native plant resources from, for everywhere. Um, and there are some other resources that are specific to some certain regions, like California also has really great resources for California. Um, but the, the Western Monarch Milkweed Mapper is a really great resource for Western states. So if you're in a Western state, you can use that as a identification tool. It's also a community science program asking people to report sightings of milkweed so that Collectively, we can get a better idea of where milkweeds are on the landscape. Um, if you're interested in learning a little bit more about milkweed ID, um, I'll share this link in the chat, or maybe Jake, if you have it handy, if you want to put it in the chat. Um, and I'll make sure that Zach gets it to share out in the follow up. Email. We have a video from one of our trainings for a community science program called the Integrated Monarch Monitoring Program that covers milkweed ID for a lot of Eastern species of milkweed. Um, we don't have one yet for the West, but I know that our science team is working on it. But um, you can watch that video. It's, it's relatively short. It's, I think, only five or six minutes long. Um, and then I'll briefly breeze through a few um, species from across the continent, from across um, the United States, at least, to just give you an idea of what's out there. Um, the white stem milkweed, Asclepias albicans, is native to uh, California and Arizona. You can see its distribution map here. This, these are counties it's been found in, um, and then the bright green are, are counties that it's not uncommon in. I think one of those has these on the, <laughs> on the website there. Um, so this is a relatively tall plant, but it doesn't have leaves. Um, so sometimes it's difficult to identify. Um, it's got this whitish yellow bloom on it, um, and it does have milky sap, so if you need to break that open and have milky sap. So you can see what the flowers look like here, the seed pods look like here. Um, so if you're in California or Arizona, you can check out what that might look like and see if it's an option to install new stages. Asclepias asperula, or antelope corn milkweed, relatively common in, you know, um, this one, you know, grows from clusters, as you can see here. Um, it's got this really interesting shape. So it's got the same, you know, five petal shape, but they're, um, the configuration of the, the petals and the sepals are a little bit different than some other things. Um, you can see that the, the seed pods are slightly different color than other milkweed seed pods, but, um, it's still, a really great milkweed. It's, it's relatively common for monarchs to be found on this plant and, and pretty easy to, to spot in the wild. Um, then we've got this other lovely one. Um, this is green milkweed, Asclepias viridis. I just love the flower of this, the contrast of the green and the, the purple on it. It's just lovely. Um, again, it is a um, a uh, relatively tall plant, one to three feet tall, and it clusters together, um, grows in, in clusters like this. And it's relatively common throughout most of the eastern U.S., um, particularly in the central flyway where monarchs are right through. So that's another viable option um, in your habitat areas if you're in one of those states there. 
I have had the, had the opportunity to see a Spookies portfolio or a Hartley Filthy when I was in Nevada several years ago, and it is gorgeous, this deep purple flower. Um, so it's a really great option if you're in a Western state and, and can find this growing. Um, it'll bloom in the middle of summer. Um, it has really quite large leaves and, and um, beautiful big purple flowers. Another fun one, woolly pod milkweed. This one is native to California. This previous area of Harpa. Um, it's got these really interesting fuzzy fuzzy leaves. Um, our, our field crews in California do find monarch on uh, woolly pod milkweed this summer. So it's a great option if you're in California. Asclepius fascicularis is another relatively common one in the West. Um, this is narrowly filthy. It's really difficult to spot. It's flaring up with you know, grasses and things like that. But um, it's got this pretty dense cluster of white flowers um, when they when they bloom, um, and they can grow in pretty dense clumps. And then we've got um, Asclepius fritella, which is tall green milkweed. Um, this one is uh, again pretty common in the central flat, central part of North America. Um, and it's got these interesting, you know, whirling leaves that um, when you think of the weed, I don't think it should be used by people commonly. So it's kind of an interesting, um, an interesting shaped plant. Um, and then we've got, sorry, um, the sand hill or uh, pine woods milkweed. Um, this one, you know, tends to you know, lay on the ground like this. Uh, the leaves are have a really distinct purple vein on them. You can see it kind of shining in the light here. Um, and this is common in the in the southeast, as you can see on the map here. Long slides. There we go. Um, this one is more common in northern states. The oval leaf milkweed. Um, its leaves are, um, again, you know, a similar shape to something more common milkweed, but it's definitely got some distinctions, um, particularly in the seed pod. You can see the seed pod um, is a little bit smoother, more of a purple color. Um, and I don't have a picture of the flower of this one, but when it does bloom, it's a, a white or green or greenish purple. Um, one of my favorite species of milkweed does not grow in Minnesota. It's um, Asclepius subulata. Um, it's also called desert or rush milkweed. This is the one I showed earlier. It doesn't have any leaves, or when the leaves are there, they're very, very, very tiny and are eaten almost immediately by the monarchs and queen butterflies that use it as a hunting plant. Um, the flowers are kind of this interesting, yet creamy, yellow, white color, um, but it can get pretty tall, two to four feet, and it grows in these really dense um, clusters. Then we've got Asclepius viridiflora, the green comet milkweed, another really common plant for east of the Rocky Mountains and even, even parts of the desert southwest. Um, so you can find, um, hopefully find this in, in areas, um, in nurseries and things like that that you can go to. Um, and, and, you know, she's got this really interesting, and still got that shape if you were to look at it under um, a close up, more close up than I'm showing you on the picture here. Um, but it's um, definitely very different from other types of milkweed. And then there's one non-Asclepius species that I want to highlight because it's a very common um, host plant for monarchs. Even though it's not Asclepius, monarchs really use it. Honey vine milkweed, uh, as in the Cynantium genus, Cynantium label. And it's a vining milkweed, or a vining plant. Um, and you can see the shape of them. They've, they've got kind of this them. Um, so even though even though it's not an Asclepius plant, Asclepius genus, monarchs will still use it. It's close enough for native that they still use it as a host plant. And it's relatively common, um, as you can see in the central U.S., smack down in the middle. <laughs> um, so you can see lots of um, uh, lots of bright green here. Um, and it's interesting to note this bright pink here are, are places where it's listed as a um, noxious weed, <laughs> which not in his head. Um, so it's interesting to note that, um, that that 
is the case in, in certain parts of, of the country when kids are still being listed as noxious. Um, and maybe Jake has more details on why this particular species and not others are listed as noxious in that part of the world, but um, I'll let him talk about that later. Um, uh oh. My computer is freezing on me. <laughs> um, I was just about to launch into, there we go. Non native milkweeds. So those are all native milkweeds. Um, those are all milkweeds that are relatively common, or if they're not common, are still acceptable to plant in, in places where they're native. Uh, but I, want, look, I wanted to switch gears a little bit into our non native milkweeds and why they are a concern. And the one that comes up the most is tropical milkweed. Um, so we'll talk about that um, in a moment here. But there are other there are other non-native milkweeds that can have similar concerns. So I'm not going to go into details on those because most of the information that we have um, right now is on top of the milkweed. But um, right now the concerns are um, that there are certain non-native species that are, can be, become invasive and they can also become ecological sinks when monarchs or adults are recognizing that they are native or that they're a viable host plant. Caterpillars don't recognize that they're a host plant. Um, and I don't have a slide on it, but it's it's related to the honey vine milkweed. It's another, there are two plants called swallow orcs that are in the Cyanatrum genus. Um, and I can share a resource on that with Zach to share out with everybody. But that one is concerning because monarchs, monarch adults will lay their eggs on it because they see it as a viable host plant, but the caterpillars won't eat it. So they're laying all their eggs and becoming a sink. And, you know, that milkweed, that cyanotrum plant is becoming a sink for um, monarchs because it's not viable as a, a food source for the caterpillars. Um, and then the other big concern with non-natives is that um, we're disrupting the integrity of native species um, and, you know, disrupting that balance and they could potentially be out competing native of more appropriate native species within their ecoregions. So um, those are things to keep in mind as I'm talking about tropical milkweed, but I'm going to talk about some of the issues with tropical milkweed here. Um, tropical milkweed is a beautiful plant. It's got these bright red and yellow flowers. Um, it's relatively easy to grow. It's found in a lot of nurseries and it grows really, really well in warm climates. So that's about half the United States. <laughs> um, in areas that don't receive a hard frost, tropical milkweed can grow year round. Um, so places like the Gulf Coast, Florida, parts of California, um, even parts of the, the Atlantic coast. Um, if it doesn't receive a hard frost, tropical milkweed can grow very well year round. Um, hey, Katie Lynn. Yeah. Before you get too far along, there is some audio issue going on. It seems like it kind of goes in and out. And then there's like kind of a static me, noise too. Let me turn my camera off and see if that helps. Does that help? Can you hear me better now? Uh, it's still doing that for some reason. Okay. Um, let me pause this. And while she problem solves that, um, <clears throat> you should be able to turn on live transcript, which is doing a pretty good job of capturing things. It's not, um, not ideal, but it, it does help out a bit. Um, worst case scenario, we can pass the mic um, uh, to Jake if necessary. Okay. Um, can you hear me a little bit better now? No, that is still quite buzzy, unfortunately. Oh, no. Okay. Give me one more minute. Jake, do you feel good talking right now, or do you want to... I can. Oh. I, lose you. I can sure jump in, or I can jump in at, at my segment if it makes sense to do that. Yeah, if you could either, if you wanted to jump to your section while Katie Lynn problem solves, um, or if you feel comfortable taking over here, whatever you think is best. But why don't, if you could uh, um, take over for a bit to allow Katie Lynn to problem solve, I think that would be great. Yeah, no problem. All right, so it looks like we are on the tropical milkweed discussion um, and then its concern 
basically kind of pick up where Katie Lynn left off. Um, these non-native milkweeds, uh, specifically tropical, can be a concern with this Ophriocystis electroscura, OE, um, for short, or for most people that's very hard to pronounce. Um, but it, it, it tends to be an issue um, as far as parasite within these plants. Um, so they are ecological sinks and uh, keeping the integrity of the native species in the appropriate ecoregions is important. Um, we wanna still encourage these native plants um, just so that way these non-native species don't potentially become invasive um, in some of these areas. And so that way they don't continue to propagate um, these high infestations of OE. Let's see, I wanna make sure my slides are matching up here. All right, so this is basically kind of the life cycle of the Ophriocystis electroscira um, in the monarch butterfly. Um, you can see kind of how um, the, the butterfly scatters spores on eggs and milkweed um, and basically how that's ingested and kind of basically recycled throughout this life, life cycle. Um, take a look at that. Um, it's a really good image kind of capturing how it kind of persists in those plants and how the infection rates can increase on those tropical milkweeds. Um, are you Sorry, back, Katie Lynn? can you hear me better now? Yeah. Okay, I dialed in on my phone. Sorry about that, everybody. Thanks for your patience. <laughs> All good. Okay, I can take over. Okay, so, um, as Jake was saying, this is the life cycle of, of OE along with um, the monarch butterfly. So OE is a protozoan parasite. It's completely harmless to humans, but can be pretty detrimental to the health of monarch butterflies and other uh, butterflies in the same genus, which include queens. Um, so what happens as, this, as these spores are formed inside the bodies of the caterpillars um, is that when by the time that the monarch is an adult, um, those spores have formed completely and then moved through the tissue, the internal tissue of the what of the butterfly of the of the monarch, um, so that they will be on the outside of the butterfly when the butterfly emerges from its chrysalis, and that can cause a lot of damage, especially when spore loads are heavy. So when spore loads are relatively light, they can still pass on the disease um, and and you know function pretty. Normally, they'll look like this. Um, they look outwardly identical to uh, uh, other adult monarchs. Um, they can fly, they can mate, they can nectar, lay eggs and things like that. But they're still passing on that disease to their offspring when they lay their eggs because the spore comes off of their bodies either onto the egg that they're laying or onto the milkweed they're landing on. Um, in heavy spore load cases, sometimes the monarch will come out like the photo on the left there. You can see it's deformed, it didn't emerge properly, um, this butterfly was not able to fly. So, and this is, this is, this would mean that that disease is no longer passed on to its offspring, um, but it doesn't mean good things for that individual monarch. Um, so these are what the spores look like. They look like these tiny little brown footballs under a, you know, high powered microscope. Um, and then this slide on the left here, these larger oval shapes, are the scales from the abdomen of the butterfly. And then the smaller shapes in there that look like little tiny footballs are the OE spores. So this butterfly was infected with OE um, and it can easily pass that on to its offspring. Also in heavy spore loads, you might see eggs that look like this kind of dusted with OE spores on the outside. Um, and if you know, um, or if you don't know, monarchs first meal as caterpillars when they first hatch is their egg casing. They'll turn around and eat their egg casing. So a caterpillar that hatched out of this egg, the very first thing it would eat is all of these spores. Um, and then as an adult, it might emerge completely deformed like this, unable to mate, unable to find food unless it was lucky enough to, you know, emerge on a flower. Um, and it definitely can't fly. So this is no longer a monarch that will you know, provide genetic material to the next generation. Um, I'm going to skip that one. 
So one of the the studies that was done from Project Monarch Health, which is based in Georgia, um, they looked at whether or not healthy monarchs migrate further than monarchs um, infested with OE, you know, con that have contracted OE. So they, they tracked the natal origins of parasitized versus non-parasitized monarch butterflies that overwintered in Mexico. And what they found is that uninfected monarchs, monarchs that don't have OE spores on them, can travel further distances than butterflies that were infected with OE. So monarchs with a heavier spore load um, originated from more southerly locations compared to the monarchs that had um, a less heavy infection. And the explanation for that is that heavily parasitized monarchs that originated from northern latitudes just don't reach Mexico, whereas healthy monarchs are better able to travel further distances. So these, the seasonal migrations of monarchs can help lower infection levels in the wild populations. And then um, what we're seeing in, in, or what we could see with, sedan, with shifts in, um, from migratory populations to sedentary market populations that stick around year round is that it will likely lead to greater infection prevalence of North American monarchs. And we're already seeing that in some areas, um, higher levels in the uh, coastal Southeast um, so you can see a high, a high rate of infection in the, in the Southeast, 67%. Um, there's a resident population of monarchs in Florida that um, don't, they don't migrate. Um, so without the migration to remove those sick individuals and with milkweeds like tropical milkweed that are, is present year round, they experience some really unique disease dynamics compared to other migratory counterparts. The other population that's got a high rate of infection is the California coast. Um, you know, California supports um, many, many monarchs, including some winter breeding populations that experience a high prevalence of OD, um, which is concerning also because there could be lateral transfer from monarchs that are not overwintering to monarchs that are, um, that are overwintering and then that can be spread to their offspring. Um, and then there's concern in parts of Texas where there are resident monarchs and migrating monarchs that overlap during the fall and spring migrations that puts monarchs, healthy monarchs in contact with infested monarchs. And these are all areas where, um, where tropical milkweed and other non-natives might be growing very well and very prevalently. And if you look at monarchs um, that originated from um, the migratory Eastern population and monarchs that were tested in Mexico, the rates are relatively low, 5.5% and 2.2%. And so this is showing this is showing another thing that the migrant it's called migratory culling. So the migration is culling sick individuals out of the population and keeping the population healthier as a whole. Um, I'm gonna, in the interest of time, skip this next slide. So there's just it, some dynamics in, in how a disease is passed on, as you can see from this diagram. So adults uh, leave spores on milkweed leaves. The milkweed leaves are then eaten by the larvae. Um, and then um, that larva will grow up infected with OE. There's no treatment. There's nothing we can do except prevent the spread of disease. Um, another way is that an adult might transfer OE to another adult. And then that adult lays an egg that has um, OE on it, and then that caterpillar then is infected with OE. So um, the sorry, this concern with tropical milkweed is really um, kind of twofold. One is that it is encouraging monarchs to stay year round um, and not migrate, which then leads to a higher prevalence of disease, which obviously, as I mentioned, has an effect on the population. But it's also, um, you know, not only are they not migrating because there's plenty of milkweed, that means they aren't going to Mexico, that means they're not finding other individuals um, to breed with that are healthy, um, but they're also perpetuating this disease in areas where tropical milkweed is growing. So if you have tropical milkweed already, don't worry, um, there are things you can do. One of them being um, slowly replace it with native milkweeds when they become available. 
The other thing you can do is cut it back in the meantime. And I know not everybody feels comfortable doing that because sometimes monarchs are already on that plant. But the recommendation is that if you have tropical milkweed growing in an area where it stays green and growing year round, is to cut it back from about October to February or March to mimic the natural cycles of native milkweeds that are going dormant for the winter. That discourages monarchs to stick around and breed and it eliminates OE from the area because OE isn't going to infect monarchs from the soil. Um, they need to ingest it. So even though winter doesn't necessarily kill OE, um, monarchs aren't going to encounter it because they're not eating the soil, if that makes sense. And I, I know there's probably questions about that, so I will answer them in our Q&A, but I wanna move forward. Um, the other concern is with invasive species, and this is just, the cyanantium species that I was talking about. This is also things like wild parsnip and um, uh, wild garlic or um, garlic mustard and things like that. So these are species that are out competing our native plants um, and sometimes can be noxious, like the case of wild parsnip. You don't really want to encounter that if you can avoid it. Um, and but they're just you know taking up space that where our native species are supposed to be and, and what the native pollinators are looking for. The Sinantrum um, Louisa and Sinantrum rossicum are the two species of swallowwort that I was mentioning earlier. And I'll, I'll make sure Zach gets the link to our handout for this. Um, but you can see that there, it's been found in many states um, and the it's a little hard to read on there, but it's easier to read on the handout. But um, the green is the um, Sinantrum levae, and then the cross hatches are where the invasive species have been found. Um, so there is some overlap. So keep an eye out for those and, and double check what you're purchasing from growers. Um, all right, I think we're on to Jake. So I'm gonna mute myself and let him take it away. Jake, let me know when you want me to advance. Perfect, thanks, Caitlin. I will try and make this section go quick so we have plenty of time for questions, uh, but we've already gone over some great uh, native milkweed ID, and then some non-native issues um, with OE. Um, so I'm gonna dive into planting appropriate milkweed for monarchs. Um, some things to consider. Uh, first, are you within one to five miles of an overwintering site? If yes, we recommend not to plant milkweed. Um, focus on fall, winter, and spring nectaring plants. That's just really integral to the basically fueling and nectaring sources for those monarchs as they're migrating in those areas. Um, if not, then just choose natives appropriate for your area, whether that be uh, milkweed or wildflowers. Um, are you in an area where tropical milkweed can grow year round? That is another important thing to consider. Um, if you are in one of those areas, like Katie Lynn pointed out, whether that's Florida, Eastern Texas, California, um, where you don't see that uh, really hard frost where those plants are gonna go dormant um, and you have that tropical milkweed, I wouldn't say to go in and just completely destroy it all at once. I would slowly just work to replace it with natives. Um, and then like Katie Lynn mentioned, work to cut it back to kind of mimic that hard frost or, or overwintering time period from uh, February to March, um, just to limit that, that OE persistence. Um, if you're not in an area where milkweed, tropical milkweed can grow year round, then still try to plant native. Um, that's, that's kind of the reoccurring theme here. Um, but if tropical milkweed cannot survive the winter, it's really not as much of a concern in the area. Uh, but as we've shown you, the, shown you today, there's really no shortage of native milkweeds to choose from. Um, so that shouldn't be much of an excuse for most areas. Um, there's some really great resources out there. Um, these are some MJV resources that we have. They're really awesome. They're concise and very informative, just front and back, and you're going to know enough to be dangerous. One of those handouts is the Gardening for Monarchs, um, so it's very monarch-centric, um, but it's got some really good information. Another one of those is planting milkweeds for monarchs, uh, so this is just a really quick hitter, kind of shows you those uh, really rough eco regions on this map and gives you some really good species to consider as far as milkweeds uh, that would grow in your area. Um, another one, of course, 
management is going to be part of the long-term success of your pollinator plantings of your gardens um, so in this management uh, a lot of folks are looking at mowing um, at least minimally um, and this is a good guide of at least when to do those things so for example here in nebraska it recommends not mowing um, from essentially may 1st to october 1st um, but if you absolutely had to, you'll see those bracketed areas where June 30th to July 10th um, would be um, an okay time if you absolutely had to mow at some point during the growing season. But it kind of lists those out throughout the different parts of the country. Um, another great resource that we have is Farmers for Monarchs. Um, it's a website and it's an initiative of the Keystone Monarch Collaborative. Um, this collaborative consists of national organizations, which represents farmers, ranchers, landowners, uh, businesses, and they're all working in the agricultural supply chain. Um, there's researchers and in academic institutions, uh, state entities, uh, a lot of conservation organizations. So it's a really diverse collaboration of all these members, and we're, we're really all working towards the same goal, and they have a lot of really great resources. Uh, to help with some of these pollinator endeavors. Um, and some more on the MJV in the Midwest, which kind of specifically relates to my position as the Midwest Habitat Coordinator. Um, again, I'm located in Nebraska. You'll see this map here kind of outlines 10 states. Those are kind of the focus states that I'm working in for the Eastern Monarch population. Um, this area, this region contributes a lot to that, the Eastern population. Um, and then we have a lot of opportunities on this agricultural land to, to make a difference in these Midwestern states. Uh, so that's kind of what I'm working with a lot. Um, and then we're working really closely with some partners like Bee and Butterfly Habitat Fund, Pheasants Forever, Monarch Watch, and a variety of others. Um, then there's also Monarch Joint Venture in California. Uh, basically my counterpart is Winter. Vaughn in California, and they're working with a variety of uh, stakeholders throughout Central California and the surrounding areas, and they're still working with uh, farmers, partners, and uh, much of that through their free seed program. Um, and they've got a variety of partners that are doing these really cool projects. These are actually all pictures from winter on some of the project sites that she's uh, putting some milkweed and nectaring resources on. Um, another really cool resource to be aware of is the Monarch Watch Milkweed Market. Uh, they actually can provide free milkweeds to schools and nonprofits if you are vetted through their application. Um, and so typically you're just paying for shipping on, on those type of things. Uh, they also provide free milkweeds for large scale restoration projects. Uh, so if you know of someone doing some conversion or upgrades or establishment of pollinator, and they wanna add some milkweed plugs to even a seeding. Um, it's gotta be typically two acres or more for most of the US, but only one acre or more uh, for these large restoration projects in California. Um, and then there's also milkweed for sale to the general public as well. Um, this is an eco region map. Uh, this is kind of specifically what Monarch Watch is, uses uh, to kind of determine what milkweeds are kind of gonna fit best for the site and your location. Uh, some folks use major land resource areas, uh, but this is another good reference to figure out, okay, what species of milkweed should I be planting um, in, my, in my projects? Um, there's some really good vendor resources as well. Um, there is the Xerxes milkweed seed finder map. Um, we have one that's almost identical at the MJV, which is milkweed and wildflower vendor map. The difference is the milkweed seed finder map is more of your, your bulk seed vendors for uh, some larger pollinator projects, while the milkweed and wildflower vendor map is gonna point you to nurseries that actually have milkweed plugs, wildflower plugs, um, to kind of have those started plants available to you. Another great resource, is again Xerxes has a bunch of different information on their website. They obviously have the vendor map, but then they have this uh, pollinator conservation resource center, 
which is going to kind of direct you to some really good um, native nectaring plants that are a good fit for your area. And they've got kind of their own version of an eco region map with associated guides here. Uh, the NABA North American Butterfly Association. Um, they're another great resource. Um, they've got a bunch of different guides and brochures for garden guides. Uh, and then also the Pollinator Partnership has some really good resources and the specific pollinator planting guides that'll break it down by basically biologically unique landscapes. You'll see that there's, you know, there's six of them right here that are just for California. So really good resources we recommend to landowners pretty often. And then the Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center, it's going to give you lists of all the characteristics of the plants that you're looking for um, or are interested in learning more about. Uh, super good resource uh, that I use pretty often. And that's pretty much most of the resources that we work with. Um, I know there's a lot of them out there that's probably overwhelming, um, but take advantage of the regional and local resources that you do have. Obviously, you guys have met Katie Lynn and myself. We're happy to be resources for you. Um, and then there's also the Pollinator Habitat Help Desk that is always available for your milkweed, monarch, or pollinator questions. So don't hesitate to reach out anytime. Fantastic. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. That was that was great. You were right. There is a ton of information there. And that's okay, because one, this is recorded, so we will share it out. And two, I will compile all of these resources and send them out uh, separately so you can access them uh, quickly as well. Um, but that is just a, a treasure trove of information. That is fantastic. Um, and uh, this uh, this topic always brings up lots of questions, and we have a few. Um, so we could start to field uh, some questions. Uh, the first one is coming in from Jen. Is tropical milk weed known by any other names, uh, I fear something like a palm oil hidden ingredient situation. Oh, that's such a good question, Jen. Um, I haven't seen it listed by other common names, but that doesn't mean that isn't listed that way. Um, the genus and species um, name is Asclepius curasavica, so watch for that. Um, so if you look at um, at the plant tag and see Asclepius curasavica, avoid it. It's tropical milkweed. Um, it's possible that somebody might be listing it as something other than tropical milkweed. Um, I know they do that with some, like sometimes swamp milkweed, which is native to parts of the U.S. is listed as rose milkweed um, because, you know, swamp has <laughs> a negative connotation to some people. So, um, you may not want something called swamp milkweed, um, but it's also, it grows well in more than just marshy areas. So just look for, my, my advice is to just look for the, the scientific name of the, of the plant, Asclepius curasavica. Yeah, I would say the only other names I've heard it called by is maybe blood flower. Uh, oh yeah, I guess I have heard that one. Yep. Uh, scarlet milkweed is another one I know. And I've, I've heard it called Mexican milkweed before, I believe. Oh yeah, yep. Sometimes um, I think I have heard that too. So, you're, excellent. You know, yeah. Firing all these memories in my brain. <laughs> <laughs> Great question. Um, here's another question, um, and this is one that I feel like I have with people the second time I talk to them about uh, native milkweeds, because we talk about native mm -hmm. milkweeds and people are super excited about the native milkweeds. And then the next time we connect, they say, you know, I tried and failed at growing native milkweeds. Uh, so where do I go from here? Is it better to not have milkweed versus tropical milkweed? I would say yes, if you're in an area where tropical milkweed grows year round, it's better to not have it. Um, if you still feel the need to have it and you feel good cutting it down in the winter, even when there might be monarchs on it, that's an okay alternative. Um, but if you're still concerned with, you know, not being able to grow native plants, I would maybe look at getting in consultation with like a landscape restoration company or a master gardener or something like that, that might be able to help you figure out what exactly in your garden might be, I guess, the issue. Um, I don't know, Jake, do you have more to add to that? 
Yeah, I mean, it seems like some folks have trouble like starting these native milkweeds when they're trying to do it from a seed. Um, so that's kind of where that vendor map plays in really big is there's tons of those re or those resources, those nurseries to get those started plugs. And they're, I mean, it's kind of like planting a garden. Uh, you have typically better success when someone else has started the plug for you and you have a green and growing plant than kind of trying to grow it from a seed. Yeah. Yeah. I have to admit over the summer I, or recently I was in Chicago and went to the Botanic Garden and they had this field of uh, tuberosa and it was absolutely gorgeous and I was envious because I've never I've never succeeded in growing it like they have it there. Um, so I have another question here and um, this is this relates back to the photo that you showed of the the egg with the the uh, OE spores on it. Um, you know yeah. if you find eggs um, or you know any live stage for that matter that has OE, but particularly eggs because it hasn't hatched out yet. Is there anything to do about it? Is there a way to disinfect the eggs? Or once you detect the OE, is has the ship sailed? Yeah, that's a good question. So, and I say this only because I know other people have encountered it. I know some people feel comfortable bleaching their milkweed with a bleach solution. I don't recommend it. Um, I know some people do recommend it, but it, you have to be really, really careful with it because it could damage any of the eggs that are on there, um, any of the other insects that are on there, but that only gets rid of the, the spores on the leaf and on the egg. It doesn't take care of anything that's already been ingested. So there's really, once the spores have been ingested, there's really nothing you can do um, other than prevent diseases. And the ways to do that are one, um, you know, grow natives. Um, the other ways are to make sure that if you're, if you are raising monarchs for a community science program, or if you're raising them anyway, you should be reporting them to a community science program. Make sure you're raising them in a way that prevents the spread of disease between individuals and then from adults to eggs or larvae, which means that if you have adults in your setup, make sure that you're keeping them separate from eggs and larvae so that if they end up having OE, they're not passing it on to monarchs that might not have it already. Um, and I want to emphasize too that OE is a completely natural disease. It has co-evolved with monarchs, so it, there's always going to be some level of it. The concern is the high rates of disease where uh, tropical milkweed are growing. So that's really what we want to curb is those high rates of disease where monarchs are no longer migrating to sort of cull it out of the population. Excellent. Thank you. That makes a lot of sense. Um, yeah, I have a, another question here, which is that, um, you know, sometimes, you know, I've seen uh, alternative uh, non-native milkweeds that are being offered as uh, alternatives to tropical milkweeds, like specifically called out as um, uh, alternatives to tropical milkweed, but they're still not native, like the giant milkweed or balloon milkweed. Mm -hmm. um, do you have similar concerns over other types of non-native milkweed, or is it specifically the tropical milkweed that is uh, problematic? Yeah, so from my knowledge, those types of milkweeds have been less well studied than tropical milkweed, but based on how they grow and whether or not they can be green year round, the concerns are still there. Um, just not quite as high because they don't seem to be as prevalent as tropical milkweed. So I would still caution against those non-natives just because of the same, they could have the same concerns as tropical milkweed. Um, but again, if, <laughs> if tropical milkweed and those other non-natives are the only milkweed available to you, it's your decision whether or not you feel comfortable growing them um, because they're the only ones available. But if it were me personally, I, I would just focus on the nectar plants then. Makes sense. Makes sense. Well, uh, this has been a fantastic presentation with so much information. And so, um, you know, the, uh, I will be sending out the link uh, to this recording um, so that you can uh, see it again. Um, and I will compile all of the resources that both Katie Lynn and Jake were referencing. So I will be sending that out. Yep. Um, and uh, so I'll make sure that you have access to all of that. And I'll post the video um, as soon as we can. Um, it's a topic that, uh, you know, comes up all the time and is a great one to, to share with others because 
putting in habitat um, is one of those things that everybody can do and you can have a tangible real world impact on an imperiled species that is you know beloved by so many uh, and when we do it we want to make sure we do it right and so this is such a fantastic uh, topic and we want to make sure that that we have the up-to-date information um, as we're trying to have that impact um, so i want to say a massive massive thank you to jake and to katie lynn uh, for uh, putting in the time to compile all of this information it's just fantastic um, thank you for problem solving on the fly with audio uh, yeah. and uh, <laughs> Sorry about yeah. the audio and that I didn't see it sooner. No, it's okay. I mean, you were on a roll, man. We couldn't, you know, it was, uh, <laughs> you're doing great. Uh, thankfully, you know, it was, it was buzzy and it would come in and out, but it was audible. Uh, it was, uh, you know, okay. distracting, okay. but not tragic. And, uh, but then it got a whole okay. lot better. And uh, so good, good job problem solving on the fly. Um, and uh, we will see you uh, next month for another amazing uh, presentation. And uh, the next up is on June 9th, which is going to be all about community science, what are the options and how do we get your guests involved? So another fantastic uh, topic coming up in a month. So thank you so much for joining everybody. Uh, share the link with your friends if they were not able to, to make it to the session. So it's, it's a topic that's relevant to all. Um, and we'll see you next month. Thank you so much. Thanks, Zach. Thanks, Zach. Thanks everybody.